And inshallah, uh, now I would like to uh, welcome our next speaker, who is none uh, other than Sheikh Saad Taslim. Uh, Sheikh Saad Taslim uh, started his edu Islamic education in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, he then went on to study at the Islamic University of Medina, where he dedicated himself to the study of Islamic sciences. He graduated with a bachelor's degree from the Faculty of Islamic Law, University of Medina. So today, inshallah, Sheikh uh, Saad dedicates his teaching to Muslim youth learning the, to balance their Western lifestyle with their Islamic values. And of course, this is important. Uh, having kids here, it's very, very important. Uh, uh, as we know, this is a different society, a different paradigm that we live in. Uh, also, he developed seminars like uh, Fiqh of Chilling. As you can see, uh, all these are, are very attractive to our youth. Entertainment and re recreation in Islam, trends, Fiqh of fashion and clothing, and deception, uh, also deception and study of shaitan. His primary message is to empower Muslim youth to be uh, comfortable with their own personal identities as part of a Western society. Uh, so uh, many, many things, but uh, we call Sheikh Saad the, the, the Sheikh of the youth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward him. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Sheikh Saad Taslim. Uh, welcome Sheikhna and to you, inshallah. Uh, <coughs> Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam, wa ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi, wa sahbihi, wa man wala. Uh, Allahumma la ilmanana illa ma'allamtana inna ka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una, wa anfa'na bima allamtana, wa zidna ilma, ya rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everyone uh, joining us here live. Uh, it's cool to be here connecting with people uh, all over, specifically Canada. I haven't been to Canada uh, in a while. So everyone who's joining us from Canada, uh, it's good to, I'm not going to say it's good to see you because I can't see you, but it's, I guess, good for you to see me. Alhamdulillah. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, moving on from Sheikh Naved's uh, talk, um, I guess the, one of the main takeaways for me uh, from the information that Sheikh Naved provided uh, was the fact that we are facing some very real uh, an extremely significant and I would say extremely harsh challenges uh, as a community, uh, as, as Muslims, uh, regardless of, of where we live. And tonight, you know, we're talking about uh, community building uh, and really what, what the community actually means to us and why the community is actually important. And so one of the things that I want to start with is the very fact that it is not really possible for us to lead fulfilled lives uh, without uh, community, without people, without um, a social life. And I say that because, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with different needs. Uh, some needs are, are, are very obvious and, and clear to us, the need to eat and drink. Okay, we all, we all understand, understand that. Uh, but one of those needs that Allah has Created us, created us with, it's a natural need that all human beings have, uh, are social needs, right? So we need to exist, we need to live with, amongst, uh, and in harmony with other people in order to truly feel fulfilled. And as Muslims, just as a side note, we understand that Allah has also created us with spiritual needs. Uh, and that's why Allah has given us guidance when it comes to our spirituality. Uh, but tonight we're talking about our social needs. Uh, living in a community, living with with other people, and so um, that is part of that is part of, of of who we are. And the reality is, you know, whether we like it or not, we need each other. And if anything, you know, this last year or so, or you know, maybe less than a year, with the coronavirus and and quarantines and lockdowns, and you know, people being at home, and even now, like you're at home and I'm at home, and and all of that, one of the things that we've come to realize is how much we need social contact, like how much we need to connect with other people. And we've really now, you know, we're, we're beginning to see how much we're missing out on and how much we need it. And even, you know, um, you know, I, I personally, I, I identify as an introvert. And, uh, you know, for me, like when the lockdown started and, you know, the coronavirus, you know, the quarantine started, I was like, okay, you know, this is not too bad for me. Like I'm an introvert, like this is cool being at home. And yeah, sure enough, like, I think I'm a lot more comfortable than a lot of people, but even introverts, you know, when, when you're coming on to, you know, almost now, you know, nine months or, you know, at a certain point, even introverts begin to realize that, yeah, we don't need as much social contact, uh, connection and contact as extroverts, 
but even an introvert needs some type of social connection. That's just part of who we are uh, as human beings. So the reality is whether you like it or not, whether we admit it or not, we need each other. Uh, we are just, we are social beings. And not only that, community uh, is a part, a very significant part of our faith. Um, is there a very significant, significant part of Islam? And that is why if you look at our deen, if you look at our faith, there's, there's so much of our deen that is related to the community. It is related to congregation. It is related to being with other people. And there's some very obvious examples. Uh, the Jumu'ah prayer, right? Uh, we don't pray Jumu'ah at home by ourselves, even though, you know, yeah, rules can change during quarantine, you know, when your life is at risk, that's another matter. But, you know, in regular circumstances, Jumu'ah is not prayed at home. Jumu'ah is prayed with other people in congregation. Uh, the Eid prayer is prayed together. Uh, the Walima, you, you know, we invite people, we feed people, everyone is together. Uh, hajj, those of you who've had the opportunity to make Hajj, um, you know, for me, the first time I made Hajj, it was a really big lesson in breaking out of my comfort zone, especially, you know, as I said, I identify as an introvert. So to break out of that comfort zone and have to be, uh, and be, you know, be around so many people, uh, subhanAllah, that was a, it was a, it was a, it was a big lesson for me. And it really helped me understand that Allah intends for us to be amongst each other, to deal with one another, to work with one, one another, to put up with each other's uh, you know, shortcomings, because you know, the reality is we all have flaws. And so we have to learn to deal with each other's flaws. And in turn, and in doing that, not only uh, do we become better Muslims, uh, not only do we become better worshipers of Allah, better worshipers of God, we become better human beings. And that is why one of the common threads you see uh, amongst all of the prophets of Allah is that they were communal people, right? They were part of the community and the, they were recognized by the community. And the best example is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Before he ever received the message of Islam, before he re received Nubuwa, the Prophet Sallallahu was a well-known, people knew him. They knew what his character was like. They knew how he dealt with other people. They knew that he was he was kind, he was he was generous, sallallahu alayhi wa They knew that he was truthful, they knew that he was trustworthy, they were amongst the people. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, min rasulin illa bi lisani qawmihi. We haven't sent a single messenger except by with the tongue of their people, meaning they were sent to engage with their people, they spoke the same language, they were known amongst their people. So once again, community. Community is a very uh, important part uh, of our faith. And you know, uh, a few years ago, uh, and I know this, this, you know, what I'm about to say may sound a little bit controversial, but those of you who know me, you know, uh, I like to keep it, keep it real, right? Hashtag real talk. Um, but a couple of years ago, there was, uh, you know, especially online, there's this thing that, that became kind of, I don't, I don't say it went viral, but it became popular. And that was the unmasked movement. Uh, which is basically, you know, if you don't know about it, like I don't, I don't want you to go back and research this stuff, but but what the, the essence of it, the crux of it was really, you know, people, a lot of people were complaining about all the problems that our masajid have, all the problems that our masjids have, right? Someone said, I go to this mosque and there's this problem and that problem. And, you know, there was a, a list of problems and, and reasons why people felt unmasked. They felt like the mosque, the masjid, wasn't for them. They didn't feel welcomed in the masjid. And like all these problems with, it, with, with, with the masjid. And you know what? If we're keeping it real, a lot of those issues were true, right? We are, we are facing a lot of challenges. There's a lot of things keeping us away from the masjid. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things keeping us away from congregating with our brothers and sisters. And, and up till that point, by the way, with that, you know, I was with all the people that are complaining. I'm like, okay, I got you, right? Like you're talking about this is wrong and that's wrong and this is a problem, that's a problem. I'm like, okay, cool, I'm with you. They lost me when they talked about the alternative or the, solu the quote unquote solution. Because a lot of times the solution that was presented to that was, you know what? We just need to move away from the masjid. We need a different space. We need somewhere else. We need to just do our own thing, you know, get away from the masjid. And I'm like, that is where you lost me. 
Because the reality is, yes, we have problems with our masajid, but the masjid cannot be taken out of Islam. The masjid, you know, which is, is, is a big, big, you know, uh, <laughs> a big sign, right, for us of congregation, of community, right? That is where we congregate, the masjid. Right? The masjid cannot be divorced from Islam. The masjid cannot be taken out, taken away from Islam. If we do that, we lose an aspect of our faith. Certain things, by the way, cannot be done except in the masjid. There are certain, certain types of reward that we get from Allah that will not be found anywhere except the masjid. And I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, there is uh, a practice known as uh, tahiyyatul masjid, uh, which is the sunnah prayer. of When you enter the masjid, you pray two rak'ahs. Uh, of, of prayer. This is something Prophet did regularly and he told the companions to do as well. When a companion would enter the masjid, Prophet would say, before you sit down, pray two rak'ahs of prayer, tahayyat al-masjid. This cannot be performed. The reward, the reward for that cannot be gained anywhere except the masjid. So we get rid of that place of congregation, we get rid of the masjid, well, we lose that reward. Um, the reward of walking to the, to, to, uh, to the masjid. That cannot be gained anywhere but the, the masjid. Simply the reward of praying in congregation, praying in the masjid, you know, 25 in one narration, 27 times the reward of, of, you know, praying by yourself. Where does that happen? Well, that happens in the masjid. Uh, and so many, i'tikaf, uh, during the month of, of, of Ramadan, uh, according to uh, many, if not most of our scholars, i'tikaf is to be done in the masjid. I'tikaf is to be done in the, like, you don't make i'tikaf in your house, right? You don't make i'tikaf at work. You know, I'm going to work for six hours, eight hours. I'm just going to make i'tikaf there. No, i'tikaf is to be made in the masjid. And this is just a sampling of the aspects of our faith, the aspects of Islam that are, that are attached to the masjid. You cannot get rid of that. So what do we do, right? And so for me, that whole like unmasked situation it was a perfect opportunity for reform. It was a perfect opportunity to be honest with the problems that we're having and then saying to ourselves, how do we go about solving these problems? How do we go about bettering our places of congregation? What do we do? And so I feel like just sidestepping the whole thing, just sidestep that whole problem, right? The reality is the mischief, as I said, is, is an integral part of our faith. But we have to now be real with ourselves and say, look, these are the problems that we are facing. What do we do? How do we go about solving those problems? What, how, like, how, do, how do we make sure, like someone had a bad experience at the masjid, and I know a lot of people have, bad, have had bad experience as, at the masjid. What do I do? How do I contribute so someone else doesn't have a bad experience? And I'll just share just one example with you. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, experiences or bad experiences that someone may have in the masjid, um, I certainly have faced this myself. I'm, I'm sure some of you have faced this as well. Uh, you go to a masjid for the first time. Let's say you, you go to a different city, uh, you go to a, a different community, uh, and you go to a masjid and you, you don't know anybody there. You walk in to go pray, and you know you kind of get the cold shoulder. And look, this is not every masjid. Some masjids, this is what happens. You, you get the cold shoulder, um, you know, and you know everyone's doing their own thing. You, you might find that the masjid is clickish, right? Everyone has their little click. You know, people are here, people are there, everyone's doing their own thing. And you just walk in and you're like, okay, you know, I, I'm supposed to, like the masjid is supposed to be a place where we feel at home. Like regardless of what city you're in, regardless of what country you're in, these are the people who have, um, these, these are the people of, of uh, these are your brothers and sisters, right? Regardless of their culture, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless, right? None of that matters. These are your brothers and sisters. So when you walk into a masjid, you're supposed to feel like, you know, your home, right? This is like, these are your people, right? Like, what? So th that's one of the expectations that, that I, you know, have, um, which I haven't let go that expectation go. I still expect that, right? But someone may walk into the mission and not have that experience. So if that happened to you and it happened to me, one of the things that I did is I said, look, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't happen to someone else on my watch, right? What do I mean by my watch? Not that I'm running the masjid and I have to run the masjid to make a difference, right? I gotta be on the board, I gotta be this, I gotta be, no. As a community member, and I don't even mean somebody who pays like community dues, or literally somebody who walks in the masjid and prays in that community. Can you be that person who when you see someone that you don't recognize, 
you give them salams and you say, welcome. It's good to have you. Do you need anything? Do you know where everything is? Can I help you? Right? So you be, you, you be that change that you're looking for. You can't control everybody else, right? And th there's a lot of problems. You cannot control the board. You cannot control the imam. You cannot control this. You cannot, even, even finances, right? We're going to talk about finances in, in a little bit, right? But you cannot control the finances of the masjid. But what you can do is you can control your finances and you can contribute. You can do your part uh, to help the, to help the, the masjid. Because, wallahi, we, we need this. We need this as with all of the problems and the issues that, that we're dealing with. One of the sources of our strength is congregation. One of the sources of our strength is community. And this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a hadith mentioned in Sunnah Tirmidhi, he actually warned us of this. He said, Alaykum bil jama'a. He said, I urge you, I urge you to stick to the congregation. Wa iyyakum wal furqa. He said, and I warn you of being by yourself, right? Meaning I warn you, it's, it's, dangerous, it's a dangerous thing to be by yourself. We, we need one another. And subhanAllah, when it comes to, you know, so many aspects of our life, we need the help and support. We need this congregation. And even on a spiritual level, we know that when our spirituality gets attacked, when our faith gets attacked, let's say from the shaitan, we know the shaitan, uh, he attacks people who are away from people who can support them, right? Uh, in, in, a, in another hadith mentioned in, in a Tirmidhi, hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, uh, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna shaytana qad ya'isa an ya'buduhu al-musallun. He said the shaytan, right, has given up hope that the musallun will worship him, meaning the people who pray, will worship the shaytan. And what this means is, and there's a few different ways of looking at this, but in general, what this means is that if you worship Allah, then the shaytan knows you won't worship other than Allah. If you're praying, you know, and, you know, and the salah here is, 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 a, is indicative of all other worship, right? Because salah is one of the main aspect, main types of worship, right? So if you're praying, right? Then the shaytan, he's given, he's given up hope in you. He's like, man, he's not gonna worship other than Allah. He's not gonna, certainly not gonna worship the, the shaytan. But what happens? So the shaitan has given up hope that if you pray, that you will worship other than, than, than Allah. But the Prophet said, وَلَكِنْ فِي بَيْنَهُمْ So what does the shaitan do? He resorts to causing problems, causing animosity amongst people. And this is so telling because the shaitan knows that if you're praying, you're not gonna, it's going to be hard for you to obey the shaitan. But if you are away from the congregation, if you have problems with people, then there is a chance that he can get through to you because there is strength in not like we know this old adage, right? There, there's strength in numbers, right? Numbers gives us strength when we are together, when we are united, when we are with one another, we can withstand so much more than we, when we are, than when we are alone. And the shaitan, that's one of his goals is to get us away from the masjid, to, to get us away from congregation, to get us away from people who can help our iman be stronger. You can help us, you know, get closer to Allah. And sometimes, you know, and one of the questions I get a lot is, you know, my, my iman is suffering and my iman is weak, uh, or I feel like my iman is kind of dipped down. Like, what do I do? How do I increase my iman? And one of the pieces of advice that I give is, look, you need to spend time with people who are worshiping Allah, people who... Um, are, are, are have submitted to Allah, people who are pious, people just, and I'm not saying like you have, just go spend time with them. And I'm sure you've, you've experienced this. Sometimes just being around people who are good inspires you to be good. People who are God conscious, people who have taqwa, simply just being in, the, in their sitting, in their gathering is inspirational for us, can, can, can help our iman. Sometimes when we're feeling low, we just need people who are there to help us and support us. And that is why this tactic of the shaitan is so powerful because he's like, look, if I, the shaitan is thinking like, if I go tell people, if I go to people directly and say, don't go to the masjid, they're gonna be like, yeah, whatever, right? Of course I'm gonna go to the masjid. Why wouldn't I go to the masjid? So how am I gonna get people to stay away from the masjid? Well, I'm gonna cause problems. I'm gonna cause fighting, backbiting, slander, uh, masjid politics, all those issues, tahrish, right? Problems, animosity. And that is how people are going to stay away from the masjid. And I bring this up because if we're waiting for our community to be perfect, 
to contribute to the community, to be part of the community, then I'm sorry to break this to you. It's never going to happen. And I say never because we're dealing with imperfect people, right? None of us are perfect. None of us are flawless. None of us are free of sin. None of us are, 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 are someone who can say, I, you know, I've never made a mistake in my, I've never wronged anybody in my life. I've never made a mistake in my life. The reality is we all make mistakes. We all commit sins. All of the children of Adam, they sin, they make mistakes. Right. This is this is how we it's it's natural. It's normal. So if we're waiting for a perfect place, it ain't never going to happen. Right. And subhanAllah, you know, just keeping it real. Once again, I used to be one of those people. And, I, you know, I just I'll admit this, you know, to you today. <laughs> but I used to be one of the people um, that used to be like, you know, these kind of avoid the message at a particular time in my life. And for me, it was it was it was really it was really um, two things. Number one was, you know, like I said earlier, I just had a lot of bad experiences at the masjid. And, you know, I had this feeling of, you know, the masjid is supposed to bring me closer to Allah. Uh, it's supposed to be a spiritual place. But, you know, every time I go there, people are so judgmental and I listen that, whatever. So, like, man, it's, it's, it's not for me. It's number one. Number two is, you know, the feeling of, do I even really need a community? Right. And so, to answer number one, um, the more I learned my faith, the more I understood my faith, the more I realized that I need the masjid, even though I may feel like I don't need the masjid, right? That even though it's imperfect, um, the answer isn't to leave it. The answer is to improve it, is to play an active role in improving the masjid. And that's one of the things that actually led me to go study Islam was I was like, yo, we have a lot of problems and I, I wanna help fix these problems and I can't do it without knowledge. I need to know my faith, I need to understand my faith. And so for me, that was what I could contribute to the challenges and the problems and the issues that we're dealing with as Muslims, as, as, as a community. And then do I even really need the community? Once again, as I learned about Islam, the more I realized I desperately need the community. And not only that, uh, another thing which was a big wake up call for me, and I think it is for a lot of people, uh, was uh, when I had kids, right? And, and the parents who may be listening to this, um, I think as, you know, if you're single or you, know, you, you don't have kids or whatever, you may be able to get away with not, not you know, not, not belonging to a community or, or not being part of, you know, the congregation or whatever. But when you begin to have kids, you realize how important it is for them to have a place that they can go to, that they can, they can experience Islam. Because one thing to talk to your kids about Islam and say, you know, Islam tells you this and tells you this and, and do this. And, you know, this is what Islam teaches us. This is our faith. And this is what you're supposed to do. And da, 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 all kind of stuff. Great. But kids need to see it. They need to live it. They need to experience Islam for them to really understand what it is. And living in a, in a, in a, in a country where Muslims are, the, are a minority, I would say they need it even more because they don't see it in their daily life. They may not see it in school. They don't, they don't see it, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in when, when they go to the park or this, that, whatever, like it's, you know, it's, they don't see it. So they need a place where they can say, you know, okay, this is, the, this is, this is Islam being, being practiced. And especially at a young, at a tender age, when they're developing, uh, we need to give them confidence in their faith. And, and, you know, it's, it's hard. Allah, it's hard. Like I, I, I grew up in, in America and, you know, uh, it's, it's hard growing up as, as a Muslim when, when you're, you're a minority and, and everyone else and you just feel different, right? And it's hard. And, and if you're already dealing, like, like you're already having problems in your faith and then you're, you're made to feel like you're, you're alienated and, you know, Sheikh Nabi talked about otherization and, and all that stuff, so you're dealing with all that stuff and, then, you know, you don't have anybody around you. Like it is rough as opposed to someone who can, has as a place to congregate and say, okay, these are my brothers and sisters and they're facing what I'm facing and they know their values are my values. Uh, their obligations are, are, are my obligations. You know, they, they, they're living their life in a way that, you know, I want to live my life and that is a source of strength. So, so having kids, you know, I really, really began to reevaluate my relationship with the community because I'm like, maybe I can get by with not being part of a community, but my kids, they need it, right? They need a place. And so my, my, my next step after that was, well, our communities aren't perfect. So do I wanna send my kid to a place where they may see things 
that are done in the name of Islam, they're not, not part of Islam, and therefore they may get the wrong impression of Islam, which was, you know, just keeping it real. Once again, hashtag real talk, that was a fear of mine, right? Like, I don't want my kid to face some bad experiences at the mission, and then they're turned off on the mission. And so how, like, so once again, that was, that was something that was holding me back. And then I realized it's a very simple answer to that. The answer to that is you be the change that you want to see in your community, right? You have to play an active role because it's very easy to sit back and, and to criticize. And, not, and that's just not to take away from the criticisms. A lot of these criticisms that I hear are valid criticisms, but it's easy to sit back and say, this is wrong and that's wrong and this and this and this. And it's another thing to, to take personal responsibility and to say, look, how do I make positive changes uh, in, my, in my community, right? And as I said, that is, that is, the, that is the, the source of our strength, especially in these challenges, in, in, with these challenges and this challenging time that, that we're dealing with. So I'm gonna leave you tonight, inshallah ta'ala, with, with four things, you know, Sheikh Nabi mentioned four things, so I'm gonna give you four things in, in, in continuing uh, in his tradition, <laughs> inshallah. Uh, I'm gonna leave you with four things uh, that you can do, um, or four things that you can, that you can implement uh, to build your community and to become a part of your com uh, community and to contribute to your community. Uh, number one, I'll say this. Representation is important, is very important. I've heard a lot of people say, look, my needs are not being met at the masjid. And sometimes it's not, uh, it's not that somebody is on purpose not fulfilling your needs or not looking out for your needs. It's just that they don't understand your needs or they are, they are ignorant of your needs, right? And I'll give you, once again, just keeping it real, <laughs> um, sisters, right? I've heard sisters say, look, you know, uh, our prayer space is terrible. Compared to the brothers, it's terrible. You know, the facilities for sisters are not like the facilities for brothers. And, 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 and sometimes it's not an issue of the, like the board doesn't care. It's just that they don't know and they don't understand the challenges that you have. And so it's important to, 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 to get representation in the masjid, and, 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 and I know this may rub some people the wrong way, but it means that sisters need to be actively involved in the masjid to get to a place in the masjid where they are part of the decision-making process. At least their counsel is sought when decisions are made in the masjid that may affect them. Likewise, um, I hear from, from, from converts that say, you know, it's like a, this is a Desi masjid or this is an Arab masjid, this is a Somali masjid or whatever. Like as a convert, like I don't feel like my needs are met. Like nobody, like there's issues that I have that, you know, I just don't feel represented. So once again, you need representation. And that starts with being an active, uh, taking an active role uh, in the masjid and not making that your goal. So make it your goal that you want to be a representative for people who are facing the same challenges that, that you are. So that's, that's number one. Uh, so once again, I wanna reiterate that, that that means taking an active, an active role uh, in your community. Uh, that, mean, that means, you know, and, and Sheikh Naved alluded to this earlier, uh, that means taking some discomfort so that the people who come after you can find some comfort that came about through your efforts. Uh, number two, uh, find your passion and use that to help. And I say this because we're all different. We all have different strengths and we have different weaknesses as well. We all enjoy different things. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone has to, and I wanna be very, I'm not, not everyone has to do the exact same thing in the masjid, right? You can be an asset to the Muslim community based off of who you are, what makes you special. And I believe we are all special in some way or the other. And actually some people have found what makes them special and some people are maybe still searching. Some people have found their strengths, but we're all, uh, we're all, Allah has made it, given us all different strengths. They may be different, but different does not mean worse. Different can mean, and a lot of times it means good, better, right? So what makes you different? What makes you special? Find your passion and use that uh, to, once again, take an active role uh, in your community. Number three, I wanna say that one of the ways the shaitan defeats us is thinking that we will never be able to to accomplish any real change, that our deeds are too insignificant, they're not, they're not gonna make a difference. And so point number three is remind yourself that no deed is too small, no deed is too little, because the true value of our deeds, Allah is the judge of that. We are not the judge of that. Even our peers 
And our community might not be the judge of that because there may be a deed that we have done that we, we, we may not get recognition for it, to be honest, right? A lot of times we, I've heard people say like, you know, I've worked in my community for so long and like nobody cares. But as a believer, we understand that even if nobody in the world recognizes us, that our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is secure. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, uh, he, uh, he said, min al-ma'rufi shay'a. He said, never belittle anything from goodness. He said, even if it's you meeting your brother with a cheerful face. I mean, that's something that you would say, like, what's the big deal of like smiling at someone? Like, is that really like when it comes to, you know, your spirituality, when it comes to like prayer and fasting and this and that and all those qiyamul layl and reciting the Quran, like what is smiling? Is it really that significant? Prophet said, never belittle anything from goodness, even if it is smiling in the face uh, of, your, of your brother or, or, uh, or your sister. And why? Because it's something that people belittle. The true reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I don't have to remind you, subhanAllah, I'm sure many of you have heard the story of the woman uh, who led a sinful life, but Allah granted her Jannah because she gave water to a thirsty dog, right? We will look at that example. And, 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 and if, if we were the judge, we'd say, big deal, right? You did all these sins, like who cares if you gave water to a dog? But for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was significant. Because of her sincerity in that deed, Allah forgave her sins and Allah granted her paradise for that seemingly small deed. So never look at your contribution and say it's too little. Whatever you can do, do it. And that leads me to my last point that since nothing is too small, help in any way you can. And if there's nothing else, you know, you can't think of anything else, something that we should all be doing, and this is the last, but it's definitely not least, is donate is give and give something. And I always say this, when I'm put in a position uh, to encourage people to donate or someone asks me to donate, I think about this a lot, is do something, whatever you're capable of, right? Because Allah knows the, 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 the true value of your donation. Whatever you give, even if it's a dollar, we don't know how significant that dollar could be, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know how much barakah Allah could put in that dollar and how far that dollar could go to help the cause that we are contributing to words. So nothing is too small. Hada wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka tu bilayk. Wa jazakum allahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. khair. Sheikh Saad, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful talk. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and make it in the skill of your hasanat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept. Any, uh, I, I think uh, I, I couldn't, uh, Saraha, any, uh, I couldn't agree more with what, what you have been mentioning. And for all the important and bringing history, I guess what you have, uh, we, what you have done, I would like to thank you for it because uh, the historical perspective you brought, it's a very important and keeping it real, as you mentioned. This is something that we need as a community. So Alhamdulillah, and both uh, the uh, Sheikh Naveed and Sheikh Saad. Jazakumullah uh, khair. I cannot thank you enough for what you have done in terms of starting this, uh, as we started this program in capacity building and uh, also to help the community uh, reach, inshallah, uh, better aman or safety and feel safe. Uh, this is a really important uh, uh, what you have been mentioning, inshallah. Jazakumullah uh, khair once again for keeping it real and for all the beautiful uh, talk and messages that you uh, have been saying. And I hope that our youth. Are, we're, we're listening because this is very, very important. Uh, these are very important advices for our youth.